out of the east, the patriarch Abraham came to settle in the land of Canaan. Abraham had two sons. Ishmael, the elder of the two, born to the concubine Hagar, was banished to the desert. Abraham's wife, Sarah, gave birth to his second son, Isaac, who was taken to Mount Moriah to be a sacrifice to his God on a stone altar which now stands beneath this golden dome. Millennia passed, and the sons of the sons of Abraham were destined to meet again, not in brotherhood, but in bitter struggle, enmity, and war over this, the promised land. Once a year, throughout the nation of Israel, everything comes to a halt. On the eve of Independence Day celebrations, this young country silently honors the fallen of six wars. Looking at the beauty of this historic city that traces its roots back to the very dawn of Western civilization, it is almost impossible to see how harm or hatred could ever be produced from within its walls. But these are just echoes of the old world, ghosts of generations that said Jews and Arabs must be enemies, for they have always been so. Perhaps then it is no coincidence that the concept of a lasting peace with the most vicious yet most vulnerable enemy of all, the Palestinians, was conceived. There is no another partner to deliver the Palestinians. With the extreme Islamic groups, it means continuation of violence and terror alone without the hope to negotiation to find a solution. If there is any chance, and I'm not saying that it is in the pocket for sure, if there is any chance, is with the PLO of Arafat. I am coming here Carrying in my, in one hand, the olive branch and in the other hand, the gun to protect the olive branch. And after 2,000 years of exile and dispersion and suffering and loneliness and smallness, these Jewish people came back. Many returned as survivors of the Nazi Holocaust, seeking refuge from a world that watched Hitler annihilate over six million European Jews. Seeking a new life in a promised homeland, they are stopped by a British blockade that keeps them out of Palestine by force. Inside the country, British soldiers fail to maintain peace between over half a million Jews and one million Arabs, each passionately pursuing their own dream of independence. With most Arabs violently opposed to even the concept of a Jewish state, tempers hover around boiling point. As transport and isolated settlements come under increasing Arab attack, life for the Jews of Palestine becomes impossible. In a belated attempt to avert the inevitable confrontation, the United Nations votes to end the British mandate. Australia? Yes. On November 29th, 1947, yes. Palestine was partitioned into two separate yes. states, Egypt. one Jewish, one no. Arab. The Jewish community, uh, the Zionist organization, accepted the partition plan. The Arab world rejected, and on the day, that the resolution passed in the UN, the Palestinians started the riots. The following day in Jerusalem, 5,000 Arabs march out, burning and looting their way towards the Jewish commercial center. A bomb on West Jerusalem's busy Ben Yehuda Street leaves Jewish dead buried beneath the rubble. Arab snipers make daily life ever more precarious. The war of independence uh, started first in a struggle with, against the Palestinians. They attacked uh, 
isolated settlements, and the main roads to the Negev, to the Galilee, and to Jerusalem. Setting out from the coastal plain, convoys of supplies make desperate attempts to run the gauntlet of continued Arab attacks. Jerusalem finds itself cut off. In April 48, I appointed uh, a brigade commander of the Harel, the Table Mount uh, Brigade. They had to continue to fight along the road to Jerusalem to clear the road and to prevent a siege on Jerusalem. In a determined effort to preserve the dwindling reserves of water and food, rationing is now introduced among Jerusalem's 80,000 Jews. On the 20th of April, we got an order uh, to move to Jerusalem. Therefore, it was attached to uh, bring about a convoy of 300 trucks that had to supply Jerusalem. And I was ordered to try to conquer and to liberate the whole Jerusalem. Uh, it was a very bitter fight. After heavy fighting, 1,500 Jewish soldiers managed to open the road and take control of strategic parts of Jerusalem. The British, busy with their own preparations for departure, are surprisingly quick to respond, issuing an ultimatum for the Jews to withdraw from their hard-won positions. We didn't give in, but they attacked us with a battalion of the Black Watch, tanks, artillery, something that we didn't have. This was to be one of the final acts of the British in Palestine. On May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion proclaims the independence of the new Jewish state in the land of Israel. While the last British troops sail out of Haifa Bay, the new Israeli flag is raised over a port now guarded by the first boat in Israel's fledgling navy. But countrywide celebrations were short-lived. The Arab countries decided to attack. Within hours, Egyptian warplanes hovered over the skies of Tel Aviv, releasing their destructive cargo. The Lebanese set their sights on Haifa and Nazareth. Syrian tanks advance on the fertile farmlands around the Sea of Galilee. The Iraqis take up positions in Samaria, hoping to cut Israel in two. Jordan's Arab Legion surrounds Jerusalem. And 10,000 Egyptians cross out of the Sinai Desert to threaten Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. With the whole country a potential battleground, the citizens of Israel soberly joined up. The realities of giving birth to a new country in this volatile region will have dramatic impact on their way of life. Historic consequences which no one could foresee. A small arms industry is started, turning irrigation pipes into primitive mortars and homemade grenades as the Jews impatiently await the arrival of weapons purchased abroad. Impatient, too, are conscripts swelling the ranks of the Arab Liberation Army. They come to join Iraqi General Fauzi el Kaoukji. Kaoukji, who set up positions overlooking the Jezreel Valley, the legendary battlefield of Armageddon. The kibbutz settlements await imminent attack. In northern Israel, each settlement battles for its very existence. They have no choice but to repel the invading armies of Syria, Lebanon and Iraq. In the south of Israel, the Egyptian threat is even more ominous. Here, handfuls of barely armed defenders drive back wave after wave of attacks. 
Standing up to five days of Egyptian tank, artillery and air bombardment, the defenders of Kibbutz Yad Mordechai are finally forced to evacuate under cover of darkness. The Egyptians advance within 17 miles of Tel Aviv. After two weeks of bitter fighting, the turning point of the war comes when the first four aircraft arrive in Israel from Czechoslovakia. With no time for test flights, the first Israeli airmen take off to attack the Egyptian column. Although militarily ineffective, the surprise appearance of the planes sends fear into the Egyptian ranks. Israel then circles the Egyptian flank and mounts the first night counterattack offensive. This throws the Egyptians into total disarray, and all plans for further advance are dropped. Despite this major victory, Israel's situation remained critical. And uh, some very tough decisions were taken, for example, like sending newcomers who didn't have any military training who didn't have even a suntan on their face, and sending them to fight at the entrance of Jerusalem. Focus of the battle for Jerusalem was the police station of Latrun, a strategic stronghold overlooking the biblical battlefield of the Ayalon Valley. This fortress-like building, dominating the western entrance to Jerusalem, was securely in the hands of the Arab Legion. The Legion had orders from Transjordan's King Abdallah to occupy every inch of Arab Palestine, but his main ambition lay with the holy city of Jerusalem. Waves of badly planned and executed operations saw casualties mount daily for the Israelis. Their failure to dislodge the Legion from Latrun led to the ever-tightening stranglehold the Arabs held on Jerusalem. When word came of the fall of the Jewish quarter in Jerusalem's old city, morale hit rock bottom. After two weeks of the war's most savage fighting, the Jewish quarter surrendered. Over 1,000 ultra-Orthodox Jewish civilians, plus the few remaining fighters that had defended them, followed their rabbis out of the old city. With the city at the end of its limited supplies, the Israelis at last completed a road across the mountains and brought the first convoy in months to Jerusalem. The siege of the city was finally lifted. Over the months that followed, the Israel Defense Forces, the IDF, was forged in fire to emerge as the well-equipped and organized fighting force that stamped its hallmark on Middle East affairs for almost the next half century. Israel cleared the Galilee and the center of the country. Egyptian forces in the south were routed from the Negev and driven back into the Sinai Peninsula, while King Abdallah annexed the West Bank into his renamed Kingdom of Jordan. But Jerusalem remained a divided city, connected to the rest of Israel only by a slender umbilical cord. The fighting was over and armistice agreements were signed. Demarcation lines drawn on the map would be determined by future wars. It was a very bitter, uh, bloody war. Uh, my brigade suffered the highest uh, number of casualties of all the brigades that fought in our war of independence. That was the longest and the highest in terms of casualties of all the wars that Israel has fought since then. The fighting left some 800,000 Palestinian Arabs homeless. They became the victims of a continuous struggle between Arab leaders' ambitions and Jewish survival in the region. These refugees were destined to become a core issue in the long simmering Middle East conflict. Since its creation, the State of Israel has fulfilled a promise to be a safe haven for Jews around the world. 
In 1949, a tidal wave of refugees was speeding its way toward the shores of the new state. Tens of thousands arrive every month from the devastation of Europe or driven from their homes in Arab lands. Almost all come penniless to the promised land. The immigrants are housed in tent cities and makeshift camps spread throughout the country. The nation's flag flies high when Israel celebrates its first Independence Day parade. Jerusalem sees its first military parade of Jewish soldiers for over 2,000 years. <laughs> Slowly, the country succeeds in building more permanent homes for the immigrants. New settlements spring up all over the country, some planned as urban centers, most as agricultural communities. Almost all are within walking distance of a border. It is across these borders that Arab Fedayeen guerrillas maintain a relentless stream of attacks on civilian targets. In March 1954, a bus is ambushed at the Scorpions Pass in the Negev. Eleven holidaymakers are killed outright. Many others are badly wounded. As always, the tracks led back to the border. This contemporary Egyptian propaganda film shows the heroism of the Fedayeen, the victorious spearhead of the war against the Zionist enemy. The Israeli army mounts continuous action against the constant Fedayeen incursions. Retaliatory raids often take the IDF deep into Arab territory, striking at Fedayeen bases in Jordan and Egypt. In Egypt, at the same time, great social upheaval is underway. On a wave of popular support, Gamal Abdel Nasser leads a bloodless coup. King Farouk is swept into exile. Egypt becomes a republic, with Nasser promising widespread reform. Aiming for leadership of the whole Arab world, Nasser is quick to raise the battle cry against Israel. Negotiating a massive Soviet-backed arms deal with Czechoslovakia, Egypt gains a four-to-one weapons supremacy over Israel. Establishing a joint military command with Syria, and with young King Hussein of Jordan, Nasser confidently begins to move. His aim, the destruction of both the Jewish state and Western influence in the Middle East. Closing the Straits of Tehran with long-range guns at Bab el-Mandeb, Nasser cuts off Israel's sea link to Africa and the Far East. The ben Gurion has declared that if Bab el-Mandeb, the entrance to the Red Sea, will be closed by the Egyptians. We shall see it in it a casus belli, a reason for war opening. A proposal to the cabinet to open the Straits of Mandeb with our own force. Moshe Dayan was then the chief of staff. He prepared the plan, but he couldn't mobilize a majority in the plan. So the issue was hanging in there. The city of Suez at the entrance to the canal that connects the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. Expelling British and French troops from their bases in the Suez Canal zone, NASA promptly nationalizes this strategic waterway. When he pours weapons into the Sinai Peninsula, war becomes inevitable. The French approach Shimon Peres, then Director General of the Defense Ministry, to present Israel with a secret plan. The French would supply Israel with badly needed weapons, and Israel would invade the Sinai Peninsula, threatening the Suez Canal. This would give the Allies an excuse to intervene and invade the canal zone. With my connections in France, the French invited me and they said, look, we plan to have an operation which will be called Muscatel. It will be us and the British 
but you have reasons of your own to participate. If you want to, we can coordinate either the time or the war. On October 29, 1956, Israeli planes fly low over Sinai, cutting telephone wires. Transport planes carry men and equipment that parachute into the Mittler Pass. Advancing to the eastern entrance of the mountain pass, the Israelis are pinned down by an Egyptian air attack. Trying to find cover, they are caught in a blistering crossfire from hidden Egyptian guns. To expose the Egyptian forces, one soldier volunteers to drive his jeep forward into the pass. A hail of bullets disclose the Egyptian positions, but leave the young soldier dead in his jeep. The following seven-hour battle sees 38 more Israeli paratroopers and over 200 Egyptian soldiers killed. The rest of the Egyptians retreat from the Mittler, escaping back towards the canal. With the Mittler Pass secured, Israeli armor rolls forward into the peninsula, along lines of movement dictated throughout history by the rigors of the terrain. Picking up momentum across the desert sands, Israel's armored corps proves a most effective fighting force in its own right. Previously thought of as support for the main infantry forces, this discovery was to shape future Israeli military thinking. So was the need of good air cover. French-built Mystère and Vautour jet fighters attack Egyptian troops, artillery and armor. Israel finds itself in hot pursuit of the tail of the fast-retreating Egyptians. Roads were littered with abandoned equipment and thousands of Egyptian soldiers who quit their positions to make their way on foot across the sand dunes of the desert. In 100 hours of battle, Israel captured the entire Sinai Peninsula, taking the Suez Canal, cleared the Gaza Strip of Fedayeen guerrillas, and finally destroyed the Egyptian gun batteries at Bab el Mandeb, reopening the Straits of Tehran to Israeli shipping. You know, people thought that we are fighting for somebody else, but we never fought for somebody else. We always fought for ourselves. And uh, if Nasser made at the same time three enemies, it was his making and not our coalition. At a cost of 180 lives, Israel had shattered three army divisions, killed 2,000 Egyptian soldiers, taken 6,000 prisoner, and captured over 50 million dollars of war material. The 56 war was part of a major operation that was planned by Britain and France against the regime of Gamal Abdel Nasser. We played a minor role in this operation. On November 1st, as the Allies landed in the canal zone, Suez became an international crisis. Too reminiscent of gunboat diplomacy and too close to nuclear confrontation, America and the USSR demand a unilateral withdrawal. Britain and France quickly buckle to international pressure and withdraw. Reluctantly, and only after UN soldiers are placed in Sinai, do Israeli troops pull out. In Israel, opposition leader Menachem Begin incites massive demonstrations, calling the withdrawal a dishonor to the fighters. As for Nasser, he became the hero who held off the combined might of Western imperialism and the Zionist enemy. One of Israel's few tangible gains from the Sinai War was a flourishing relationship with France. As well as a continued flow of conventional weapons, French assistance helped build Israel's secret nuclear reactor. 
At that time, to build a nuclear reactor was quite a sensational story. Nobody believed that a small country like uh, Israel can do it. I wasn't impressed by that, but we can do it then, and we did it. And it came out that this created also a sort of a deterrent around Israel. It was really foggy, ambiguous. And on many occasions, many people ask, why don't you get rid of the ambiguity and be clear? And the answer is very simple. If ambiguity can create a deterrence, why get rid of it? Why should we tell our neighbors, look, don't you worry, we have nothing. We have never said that we have something. Over the next decade, the border with Egypt remains relatively quiet. In Jerusalem, Israeli and Arab Legion soldiers face off across a divided city. High walls separate the two sides, but just meters from the border, life goes on as normal. Children of immigrants play together on one side, while across the street, around the Damascus Gate, it's business as usual. From the roof of City Hall, Mayor Teddy Kollek shows Alfred Hitchcock the scene of a divided city. The Golan Heights, great natural ramparts fortified with Syrian gun emplacements, dominate the Sea of Galilee and the lush, fertile fields of the Hula Valley. Undefined since 1948, the border is determined by the plough. Under a constant threat of landmines from below or being fired on from above, farmers work with permanent army protection. Increasingly, the Israeli Air Force retaliates against Syrian positions. Below the heights, life in the isolated kibbutz communal farms is especially tough. Settled in the remotest parts of the country, these villages become a buffer against their hostile neighbors. But the morale and the ideals of these pioneers remain high despite the presence of Assyrian guns. The masses call for jihad, holy war against the Zionists. While Egyptian television sends a clear message to Israel. The Arab nation has decided that the land of Palestine will be purified from your presence. Therefore, pack your belongings and escape now before death finds you. Egypt demands a UN withdrawal from Sinai and Gaza. The whole country waits for war. Chief of Staff Yitzhak Rabin supervises the preparation of one of the most daring battle plans ever conceived. On the morning of June 5, 1967, the Israeli Air Force takes to the skies in a desperate, all-or-nothing bid to break the fighting power of Egypt. With split-second timing, Israeli jets arrive simultaneously over 11 Egyptian airstrips. Just as the Egyptian pilots below 
were having their morning coffee. Without reducing speed, in one pass after another, they devastate the aircraft laid out neatly on the tarmacs below them. We prepared the Air Force to win quickly and decisively. Complete air supremacy. The aspiration was not to fight, to win it by dogfight in the air, but to neutralize and destroy the air forces of our enemies by entirely different perception. And no doubt, the major success was in the first three hours of the war. Over the next three hours, the young Israeli pilots fly non-stop, destroying hundreds of Egyptian planes on the ground. Establishing control of the sky, they fly over a thousand sorties. In support of the ground troops barreling across the sands of Sinai, they do untold damage to Egyptian forces. It now remained for the ground forces to finish what the Air Force had begun. And so they did. In four days of almost uninterrupted fighting, with fierce tank-to-tank -tank battles raging across the desert, Israeli armor and infantry breaks the back of seven Egyptian divisions. We developed advanced gunnery system that brought about tremendous improvement in the accuracy of our gunners. We then really knocked out tanks in two kilometer range, which was quite unusual for all the tank forces all over the world. Capturing the whole of the Sinai Peninsula in less than 100 hours, thousands of Egyptian prisoners fall into Israeli hands. The war with Jordan begins when King Hussein orders his artillery to open fire on Jewish West Jerusalem and along the borders. Told by NASA that Egypt is scoring spectacular successes, Hussein rushes to join the ranks of the victors. It proves to be a fatal mistake. Israel's reply is a swift three-day campaign that sweeps the Jordanians from the West Bank and pushes the border back to the Jordan River. Not stopping there, Israeli armored columns press north, straight into action to dislodge the Syrians from the Golan Heights. Under pressure to complete the operation, before a ceasefire comes into effect, Israeli armor attacks. In a maneuver they had been specially training for in secret, Israeli tanks cut a road straight up the Golan's steepest slope, exactly at the point where the Syrian defenses are weakest. With a great loss of life in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the infantry overcomes a near impregnable fortress. When it falls, the Syrian army crumbles. Many Syrians fall prisoner, and finally, Israel occupies the Golan Heights. But without doubt, the central and most symbolic battle of the war came on the third day in Jerusalem. After 30 hours of continuous and bloody fighting, in which they lost over one in five of their men, a reserve brigade of Israeli paratroopers managed to break in through the walls of the old city, here at the Lion's Gate. In house-to-house -house fighting along every inch of its narrow lanes, with Arab Legion snipers covering them from every possible angle, the troops edged their way towards the Temple Mount. At last, the Western Wall, holiest site of Judaism, is back in Jewish hands.
Within days of the city being united, the dividing walls are dismantled. Jews and Arabs mingle on the streets, fascinated to meet one another face to face. In a united Jerusalem, the military parade marking Israel's 20th anniversary displays the country's newly won pride, along with all the captured Soviet weapons. The Six-Day War is over. The victory is total, or so it seems. A bomb rips open the Machane Yehuda market in Jerusalem, killing dozens and wounding many more. The car bomb, parked outside a barber shop, was timed to explode on Friday afternoon when the market was full of shoppers. The attack, launched by PLO terrorists based in Lebanon, is a reminder to Israel that it has a million Palestinians under occupation. Soon after, a bus is rocketed by terrorists in the north, killing and wounding scores of schoolchildren. The Six-Day War. Where this had been a swift and decisive war, the next, the War of Attrition, will prove a long, drawn-out and painful campaign. Trained for mobile and fluid military action, Israel's army reluctantly digs in to a line of defensive bunkers along the Suez Canal. Snipers from observation towers keep the Israelis pinned down in their trenches, unable to raise their heads. Israeli casualties rise to 70 a month. One massive Egyptian bombardment kills 15 soldiers in a single day. Gradually, Israeli counter-strikes silence the Egyptian guns, but tension remains high. When President Nasser dies, to be replaced by Anwar Sadat, the southern border goes into a state of flux. The lands gained during the Six-Day War quickly become popular tourist sites, and later, new settlement areas for the Israeli people. Oil, discovered under the sands of Sinai, plus cheap labor from Gaza and the West Bank, helped create a boom for Israel's expanding economy. As affluence spreads amongst the people, it gives rise to the one thing Israel can ill afford, complacency. The Day of Atonement, 1973, the holiest day of the Jewish year. Nobody drives, no radios play. Believers give up the day to prayer and fasting. At two o'clock in the afternoon, the combined power of 3,000 artillery pieces opens fire. The invasion of the Sinai and the Golan Heights begins with a vengeance. Through the barrage, 8,000 Egyptian assault troops cross the Suez Canal in boats. In a set-piece movement, practiced to perfection, they establish a bridgehead. 70,000 troops and 1,700 tanks follow them across the bridges. Against them stand a meager 436 Israeli soldiers in isolated fortifications, seven artillery batteries, and three lone tanks on the canal itself. They are overwhelmed. Soon the Egyptian flag flies proudly over the east bank of the canal. Israel's first line of defense, 170 tanks, moves forward, only to be mauled by thousands of Egyptian infantry firing portable Saga anti-tank missiles. By morning, 140 tanks are just burned-out shells. And Egypt 
holds a line 10 kilometers wide, the length of the canal. The surprise was complete. Israeli intelligence swallowed Arab propaganda that Egyptian and Syrian activity was only in response to fears of impending Israeli attacks. Out of the smoke in the north, the first of 1,500 Syrian tanks bear down on the solitary Israeli tank platoon in a forward position. Sweeping on, Syria's central thrust is met by 150 Israeli tanks. Stopped in a deathlock that lasts for two days and two nights of continuous fighting, it leaves only 15 Israeli tanks operative. On both fronts, Israeli planes crash into a solid wall of SAM missiles and conventional anti-aircraft fire. Fifty jets fall in the first three days, victims of a desperate effort to check the Arab onslaught. Our air force failed in the struggle between the planes against the ground-to-air system. We were caught completely by and surprise. If we have to pay the price for living, we have to pay. Israel is on the verge of destruction. That can give in. According to Time magazine, when all seems lost, Golda orders 13 atomic bombs assembled and loaded onto Israeli Mirage and Phantom jets. Mr. Peres, is actually a decision was taken to arm planes with the nuclear weapon? Well, you have more information that I do. I wouldn't go into it. Is, it, is this a journalistic fabrication? Well, I'm not a commentator, I mean. Why should I refer to it? Apparently, just before the bombs are activated, the tide of battle begins to turn. A week into the war, 1,000 Egyptian tanks begin an offensive to break out of their stronghold and into the Sinai Peninsula. It was to lead to the biggest tank battle since World War II and the turning point of the war in the south. Uh, the Israeli army, I would say, mainly the soldiers, the tanks, the lower ranks, felt that they fight for their life, for the life of the country. I believe this spirit, this capability, saved us. Dragging portable bridges and under continuous Egyptian fire, the troops work their way forward. Divisional Commander Major General Arik Sharon arrives first at the canal, but without bridges. Against orders, and to the fury of his commanders, Sharon manages to get a force of only 30 tanks across the canal. In rapid movement on the lightly defended desert, they destroy missile bases, opening the skies to Israeli jets. A UN ceasefire stops the Israeli advance, which by then is barely 100 kilometers from Cairo. For two days, Israel chases the Syrians off the Golan Heights, across the 1967 border, and into Syria itself. President Anwar Sadat wipes clean the Arab shame of three decades. He has removed forever the psychological block of Israeli unbeatability and Arab inferiority. In Israel, people's most precious belief that the country has an impregnable shield the Arabs can never penetrate is shattered. The 1977 elections proved to be a revolution in Israeli politics. Israel goes to the polls and elects longtime opposition leader Menachem Begin, doing away with the Socialist Labour Party. And if that were not change enough, Barely six months later, President Anwar Sadat of Egypt lands at Tel Aviv airport. On his way to Jerusalem, Israelis respond enthusiastically to his courageous peace initiative. In March 1979, on the White House lawn in Washington, U.S. President Jimmy Carter 
hosts the signing of the peace treaty between Israel and the largest Arab state. While talks progress towards peace in the south, Israel's northern border is on fire. Katyusha rockets fall on towns and villages every night, fired from PLO strongholds over the border. Life becomes unbearable. The PLO attacks seemingly at will. Drawing strength from its leader, Yasser Arafat, it mounts a wave of terror designed to spread fear in Israel and around the world. London, June 3rd, 1982. Outside the Dorchester Hotel, Israel's ambassador Argov is gunned down by Abu Nidal's terrorist group. June 6th, 1982. 1100 hours. The first Israeli forces invade the beaches of southern Lebanon as armor and planes roar into action. Defense Minister Arik Sharon assures the Israeli cabinet that the action would be over in 48 hours. Mr. Begin told us that he wants to move the army 40 kilometers from the border for three or four days, clean it from Katyusha's, and then go back. Instead of four days, it began to be a war of years. Instead of 40 kilometers, the army all, all of a sudden arrived at the entrance of Beirut. The central and eastern arms engage Syrian troops in fierce fighting. As the central thrust advances, it undermines the Syrian grip on Beirut itself. Israeli troops barrel toward the city. With no break in the fighting, Israel's forward units drive into Christian East Beirut. Begin believes the Christian militiamen will finish off what is left of Arafat's force. Sharon disagrees and orders planes and artillery to open fire on Muslim West Beirut to pound the Palestine Liberation Army into submission and surrender. Israeli troops capture the airport and the Beirut-Damascus Highway, the Syrian escape route from the city. In August, as America and Lebanon seek a country willing to take Arafat's fighters, Arik Sharon orders the heaviest bombings yet, killing some 300 people. In Israel, growing public pressure calls for a stop to the bombardment of Beirut and demands that the boys come home. For the first time in Israel's history, the moral conviction of the Israeli army begins to break. Early September sees over 14,000 PLO and Syrian forces leave Lebanon. Yasser Arafat, having held his position honorably throughout the whole invasion, is forced to move his headquarters from Beirut to Tunis. This is a part of this long march yes. to our independence. States to our capital, Palestine, Jerusalem. In the wake of the withdrawal, to prevent intercommunal violence, the Israeli government orders its soldiers into West Beirut. But Arik Sharon takes the opportunity to surround the refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila, where, he claims, 2,000 armed PLO terrorists are hiding. The camps are then turned over to the Christian militiamen. With not a single armed PLO soldier in the camps, hundreds of unprotected men, women and children are butchered in a night of senseless slaughter. The moral ground upon which Israel has always stood is rapidly sinking beneath her feet. A climate of shame is in the air. First to take advantage of this are the Palestinians of the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip. They had watched the misfortunes of their brethren in Lebanon. Now they were quick to act. Brave young men with nothing to lose confront Israeli security forces in a running battle. The teenage stone throwers defy the curfews, tear gas and rubber bullets. The Intifada 
or Palestinian uprising has begun. The Intifada differs from other acts of terror because it was maybe the first time that the Palestinian people as such mobilized themselves on the side of the Intifada people. It was really more of a popular movement than ever before. I came to the conclusion that we cannot solve the relations between the Palestinians in the territories during the period of the Intifada by military means. The Palestinians of the territories have been passive and silent for decades. Suddenly, they find they have a voice, and one the outside world wants to listen to. TV crews from every nationality jostle each other whenever the youngsters take to the streets. The younger they are, the more poignant the pictures. They become a generation of media stars, heroes of a television war. Throughout the towns and villages of the West Bank and in the overcrowded and unhealthy refugee camps of Gaza, a new generation of Palestinians stop waiting for the world or some faraway liberation organization to solve their problems. Then suddenly, media attention shifts when Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, triggering the Gulf War. The public is advised to keep gas masks within reach. Every resident of Israel and the territories is issued with a gas mask. From the center of Families at home improvise hermetically sealed rooms against bacterial or chemical warfare. It was with great fear that Israelis watched TV on the first night of the war, waiting to be sent to the shelters and told to put on their gas masks. teams are sent in to check the air for poisons. No bacteria, no gas. The mask goes everywhere with people and it becomes part of the season's fashion scene. And when the scuds fly, everyone puts on their mask and continues life as normal, almost. The Americans rush batteries of Patriot missiles to Israel. Within a few days, half of Israel's population is arrogantly sitting outside, watching the Patriots explode the scuds high above their heads. This was perhaps the first war that the Israelis could sit back and watch, even if they could not really enjoy it. But the world is not the same after the Gulf War. A new friendship, forged in the fire of a war against a common enemy, has brought Arabs and the West closer than ever before. After the Gulf War, we, ag we agreed upon for uh, President Bush initiative uh, to go to Madrid conference and to participate in it. The bilateral talks took place in Washington, uh, but uh, the Israelis were maneuvering till we start uh, this uh, secret negotiation which took place in uh, Oslo. Then suddenly, the Norwegian government shocks the world. Foreign Minister Holst arrives in Jerusalem, carrying a declaration of principles already signed by Yasser Arafat. 
For months, it seems, Holst has been secretly hosting direct talks between the Israeli government and the PLO. Premier Yitzhak Rabin signs the declaration on behalf of Israel. The opponents of peace become more violent in their resistance. Extremist Palestinians, the Hamas and the fundamentalist Islamic Jihad group launch daily attacks on Israeli citizens and soldiers, trying to kill the peace initiative even before it is born. Jewish settlers of the occupied territories religiously oppose life under Palestinian sovereignty. They hit out at their neighbors, attacking Arabs in the streets. They too are determined to stop the peace process. Robin Perez are not the Jewish people. We are the Jewish people. We make the rules. Not Robin, not Perez. The two sides ratify the agreement. Like its predecessor 14 years before, it is a historic moment, even if Mr. Rabin's handshake is a little hesitant. Many things happened that I didn't believe that would happen. Many things happened that I believe that they will happen. I came to the conclusion, if there is any chance, is with the PLO of Arafat. The Israeli army finally pulls out its bases in the Gaza Strip and Jericho, ending 27 years of bitter occupation. Yasser Arafat quits Tunis and arrives to live in Gaza. Making a triumphant entrance, Arafat returns from exile to take up residence as leader of his people. This is an appeal from me, here from Gaza. For the whole international community to help us to protect the peace process through the real and the honest implementation to what had agreed upon. And especially, we are facing now troubles concerning Jerusalem. King Hussein of Jordan is next to sign his name on a new page of Middle East history. As King Hussein makes his historic flight over Jerusalem, tensions are running ever higher through the crowded streets of East Jerusalem, where neither Palestinians nor the rest of the Arab world have ever accepted the fact of a united city. And Israelis, who will never give up their hold on the city, say they will fight to prevent it ever being divided again. But as long as the future status of Jerusalem is not yet fully agreed to by all, the city of peace is sitting on a powder keg of sensitivities. The Palestinian institution, the holy, sacred, Christian and Muslim places in the holy city. And Israel had the right to make any demographic change or to discuss with any other body the situation in the Holy city, Jerusalem, but only with the Palestinians. Behind the closed doors of prejudice, where windows of compromise never open, and the banners of extremism wait to be unfurled, where neither Palestinians nor the Israelis, who will never give up their hold on the city, say that Jews and Arabs must be enemies, for they have always been so. They didn't win a single war, and we, who won all the wars, didn't win a single peace. So each of us has had to draw the conclusions. After almost 50 years, will Israel at last be recognized by all its neighbors and find a full and equal place among the nations of the region? Well, uh, it's true, in accordance to the Bible, all the prophets came from this region. I would not advise anyone to become a prophet. What will happen in the coming 50 years? We have to have a policy that gives a peace a chance. 
Thus it may come to pass that nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more.